Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is May 4th, 2016, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, it's Bye Bye Ted as Cruz takes a bruisin' in Indiana. Even the establishment's last hope, Kasich, is dropping out as Trump moves on to Hillary. Even though she lost the popular vote, she still got as many delegates as Bernie in Indiana. And if you'll bear with me, I want to really emphasize this point. Time has not been kind to Al Gore's inconvenient truth. We look at the tentpole film of the global alarmist movement on its 10th anniversary. You won't believe what he predicted. Why do you directly contradict yourself in the testimony you're giving about this scientific question? All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. The most notable news, or I guess debatably the most notable news, Ted Cruz has suspended his campaign after being crushed by Donald Trump. We see Trump delivers a knockout in Indiana as Cruz drops out of the race. From the beginning, I've said that I would continue on as long as there was a viable path to victory. Tonight, I'm sorry to say, it appears that path has been foreclosed. Together, we left it all on the field in Indiana. Help me, John Kasich. You're my only hope. I'm laughing here because today is Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you. And John Kasich put out this campaign ad uh, saying that you need to vote for him because he's the last hope. A study of more than 44,000 Americans across all 50 states reveals that Governor John Kasich is the only GOP presidential contender that could get more electoral, that is, college votes than Hillary Clinton and beat her in the general election. And then he got out of the race. So I guess the Sith Lords came down on him pretty harshly, and he decided to abandon his campaign. And we have the article right here. Uh, John Kasich is ending his presidential candidacy. And they point out that after Indiana, uh, Trump has 1,046 delegates, while Kasich has just five, uh, excuse me, 152 delegates. And I believe that's even fewer than Marco Rubio had when he was in the race, you know, how many months ago? So um, Kasich was never really in it. And beyond that, he's been quoted as saying that he didn't have his heart in the campaign anyway, which uh, as we were talking about at lunch, myself and Joe Biggs, he was like, well, that kind of sucks for all of his supporters and donors that put into his campaign that his heart's really not in it. But the news of last night didn't just sit around the GOP. It also had news about Bernie Sanders. Some people call it an upset. I just say it's a flat out victory for Sanders. I'm not going for Sanders, but I think the guy does need a fair shake and a fair representation in this election. And he had a victory over Mrs. Clinton. Granted that she already had super delegates before the whole thing even began, so it, it wasn't that big of a ruhaha for Bernie Sanders. But it shows that people are into Sanders. He does have a following. We go out, we do these man on the streets every week. Sanders, Sanders, Sanders. Every now and then you run into a Hillary supporter, but it's mostly Sanders, at least here in the city of Austin. It may be different where you are. So I know the guy does have support, and I want him to get a fair shake in this election uh, because, quite honestly, I don't know how Sanders would do in a debate against Trump, but I think Hillary would just not have a very good time. She has a lot of skeletons in the closet that I know Trump is not scared to pull out of there. You know, it'd be like a, the Scooby-Doo deal, you know, just skeletons falling out the closet everywhere. But uh, we'll see what happens on this as it continues. Now, as we're talking about Donald Trump, I have to give the guy credit where credit is due. If you saw the Alex Jones show a little bit earlier today, we all came in here during the fourth hour. And while I'm not a supporter of Trump, I'm also not a supporter of Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton, I do recognize this man has overcome overwhelming odds, a continuous, negative, nasty media campaign to smear him in every way possible. As I always say about the guy, there are legitimate things you can criticize, the torture and the wall and other things as well. I know he says a lot of off-color things, but just sticking to his campaign in general, his platform in general, people so often misconstrue what this guy says. They say he wants to deport uh, all the Muslims. I've never heard him say that. He's, they say he wants to support all the, the Mexicans. I never heard him say that. But th they have such a strong campaign against this guy. I have to give him props that he overwhelmingly trumped this, uh, <laughs> to use the word, and came out on top. And we see this article 
and this says the Never Trump numbers. You guys know the hashtag Never Trump campaign. The television ad campaign to defeat Donald Trump was at least, at least $75 million, according to an ad tracking firm. It comprised of nearly 64,000 ad spots throughout the campaign. A pro Marco Rubio group spent the most against Trump. We see Ted aired a group of ads, uh, the second most against Trump. Little Jebby and his super PAC spent nearly $10 million to Trump Trump, and Mrs. Clinton thus far has spent an estimated $5.2 million on ads, all to come up with butt kiss, because this guy is still leading in the polls. Love him or hate him, personally, I'm going for uh, McAfee 2016. Pick your poison, but the guy has overcome the odds, and I do give him credit for that. And as I was saying earlier on the show, I'm glad to see that a person can go against the mainstream media and win. We saw a similar thing with Rand Paul when he stepped out of the debates uh, several months ago and hosted his own event, very popular. Donald Trump did a similar thing, very popular. And it shows that you do not have to be a slave to the mainstream apparatus. You do not have to go and play nice with the pundits. You don't have to be on their shows. You don't have to you know, play by their rules, let them do all the dirty tricks and all these other things they wanna do, You know, surprise guests, all this other kind of crap. You can go out on your own and make your own way and he's done that, and I do give him props for that, even though I'm not going to vote for him. <laughs> now, let's talk about some other things that are going on, something that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, the subject of college and your education, because I guess I'm the youngest reporter here on the staff. I was the one who was in school the most recently, and I encounter a lot of people. We even had a guest here on the show at one point to talk about college. Now, to be very clear, I think higher education is good. I think your education or your um, growth shouldn't cease after high school. You should continue on in some way, whether that's trade school, or you get an internship, apprenticeship, whatever, I think you should continue to grow. But the academic system as it is in the United States of America, where it's overinflated with the cost, with the books, with all the BS courses that you shouldn't have to take, I don't think some doctor should have to take a course in art appreciation. Now, if you wanna take art appreciation, that's fine, but I don't think you should have to take that to fulfill a requirement when it has nothing to do with your core interests. And that's the issue that I have with a lot of these colleges, or pretty much all colleges here in the United States of America. But now we have this article from CNN, just how much better off are college grads anyway? Because you always hear the numbers, they're gonna make X number of dollars and all that. Now I'm gonna talk about their numbers and I'm gonna give you my perspective. Uh, they start off here with the unemployment rate, which for college grads is point, uh, excuse me, 2.5%, and for high school grads is 5.6%. So obviously higher for the high school students. Also, the weekly wages, they say a college grad a college grad is going to make $1,227 as opposed to a high school grad that makes close to 700 and also the percent of population that's employed. They say 82% of college grads, whereas 67% of high school grads. Now, sounds good. It sounds all rosy and cheesy and, you know, it makes you want to give a, a big hug to your high school guidance counselor. But the issue that they're leaving out of here in my personal experience is number one, how long did it take you to find a job after you got your degree? Because they always want to tell you the story. They gave me the same spiel back when I was in high school. You know, they bring in some guy, oh, look at, you know, Billy over here. He's a model and that's all he is. He is the model of a guy who went to school. You know, he got a job before he even finished his degree. You know, he got all the scholarships and all that stuff and everything is great for him. That doesn't happen for most people. I'm trying to tell you right now, I went to college, I understand. While Billy may be a success story, that doesn't happen for everybody. It's kind of like watching uh, you know, uh, a ESPN documentary about the guy who overcame all the odds, you know, Kurt Warner. You know, he went through all the stuff, he made it to the NFL, I believe won a Super Bowl. And that's kind of what they bring in when they bring in you know, Billy to your classroom. He is the model, not the norm. Uh, also, the employment that you do get, is it a temporary job or is it some type of uh, full-time job? Do you have a nine to five or are you doing freelance work trying to make your ends meet? I think that's something very important. And also your student loan situation, because once again, they'll bring in Billy, you know, look at Billy, he has a great job. My question is how much student loan debt does that guy have? Did he go to community college and save some money? Did he go to the big state school? And is going to be paying back those student loans for the rest of his life. They don't ever want to talk about that. And I make a lot of uh, you know, college waving people very uncomfortable when I talk about student loans because that's kind of like the iffy thing you can't touch. And you know, I don't ask people how much money they have in the bank, but if you're trying to convince some young impressionable student to go spend, you know, 
$30,000 plus dollars and a university. I think it is a relevant question to ask that person who's been out of school for 10, 20, 30 years, how much student loan debt they are still paying back and how much did they have when they started? And they went, oh, you, you, you get in my business like, well, if I go to school and follow your plan, isn't it going to become my personal business? How much student loan debt I have? So I think that is a relevant question. They don't ever want to talk about that. So for me to you, if you're young or even if you're an older person and you're thinking about going to school, I would just flat out ask them, how much student loan debt do you have? How long do you think it's going to take me to pay it back? At what rate am I going to be paying this back? Because they're going to tell you, okay, you're going to get out of school. You can make $80,000 a year. I'm making up some number. You'll be able to pay it back in X number of years. And you have to sit back and wonder, okay, am I going to be able to get a job as soon as I walk out of a classroom? Uh, even if I do get a job, is it going to be the job I want in my field? If it is the job in the field that I want, am I really going to make $80,000 a year? These are the things that you have to think of for yourself. They're not going to tell you this. Because after you're done, it's going to be on to the next one. And they got the thousands, millions of them coming in to fill your spot. So you have to take this up for yourself. Now, something that Iran is taking up for themselves very ser seriously, this is the Strait of Hormuz. And we see that Iran threatens to block U.S. access to vital waterway. And this is the deputy commander of Iran's powerful Revolutionary Guard. He said Iranian forces will close the strategic Strait of Hormuz to the United States and its allies if they threaten the Islamic Republic, Iranian state media reported on Wednesday. And the Strait of Hormuz is where they bring in a lot of the oil, uh, nearly a third of the oil that is traded by sea goes through there. And a general was quoted as saying, Americans should learn from recent historical truths, likely referring to the January capture of 10 U.S. sailors who entered Iranian waters. And you guys probably remember that. It's the scene of the guys and the down on their knees hands on the head that made a lot of people uncomfortable. But at the same time, if I was in that position, I can't say I'd jump up Rambo style and we'll follow these guys. Or I'm not passing any judgment onto them, but it's a very serious issue. Uh, you can debate whether Iran is uh, right in the situation. If you're a United States citizen, you're probably going to say they're very wrong in it. Uh, but I think this is a more straightforward deal than what we see in places like Syria and Libya where United States forces have very clearly been in the wrong. This is more of a murky type of situation, but uh, you can all judge it for yourself. Now, something I think is very black and white as far as who was wrong is when you talk about El Chapo. And they'll say El Chapo did this. He, you know, he captured this many people and he kidnapped this many people and he ran, you know, so many tons of drugs. And yeah, the guy did all that, but who allowed this guy to do, do these things? Uh, I referenced the movie Sicario. If you guys haven't seen it, I definitely recommend you do see it if you want to learn more about the war on drugs. And it is a fictional story, but it references real events and uh, happenings in the world. Basically, uh, the spoiler, spoiler alert, uh, the United States government is going into Mexico unconstitutionally, illegally, and uh, giving certain cartels uh, a one-up against their competition. They'll go in there and kill their competition to uh, control the drug trade. That's kind of what's happening. And now we see this article here that El Chapo had nearly 600 airplanes and thousands of runways in Mexico. And it says in the last decade, the Sinaloa cartel owned the largest fleet of airplanes in Mexico with 599 that were seized between 2006 and 2015. By comparison, Air Mexico, the country's flag carrier, operates just 127. And you may be thinking, these are small Cessnas, and yes, many of them were, but they also had uh, Rockwells, Gulfstreams, Pipers, Beechcraft, and it also says that in a secret testimony filed in the U.S. District Court in Chicago in 2014, revealed that Guzman, El Chapo, also owned a personal fleet of Boeing 747 jets. Those are pretty big, if you ask me. Also, speedboats, submarines. I, I mean, that's some next-level stuff. Uh, tractor trailers and freight trains. So... Next time you see those rap videos are riding around and they're rented Bentleys and all that stuff. That's one thing, but to own a submarine and a train, that's next level stuff. And who allowed El Chapo to do this? Oh, of course, the United States government, because they've given them uh, 50 cows and the rest of it. You can see those articles on CBS. CBS has done a really good job reporting on El Chapo. I think they even talked to him. And yeah, they did talk to him in prison. They found out how he dug out all of his cells and all this stuff. Now, I'm going to end tonight with an inconvenient lie, and that's exactly what it has been, because people will accuse us here at Infowars.com of fear porn, you're trying to scare people, you're doing all this other stuff with your predictions and all this stuff, it doesn't come true. I want you guys to look at this clip 
from Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth. This is just a trailer. Then we're going to talk about some of his predictions. Let's take a look. This is Patagonia 75 years ago and the same glacier today. This is Mount Kilimanjaro 30 years ago and last year. Within the decade, there will be no more snows of Kilimanjaro. This is really not a political issue so much as a moral issue. Temperature increases are taking place all over the world, and that's causing stronger storms. This is the biggest crisis in the history of this country. Now, once again, they'll say you guys are climate deniers, you're fear pointers and all this stuff. This is think about the, the Inconvenient Truth movie. Al Gore is saying that by now California and Florida would be covered in water. Polar bears can't swim, all this stuff. And I have this list here from the Daily Caller that talks about a few of his predictions. Number one, Kilimanjaro still has snow on it. And they say, yes, it's been a decade since Al Gore made his movie, and Kilimanjaro still has snow on it year-round. Also, Al Gore left out the 15-year hiatus in warming, saying that uh, Gore's movie released right in the middle of the so-called glo global warming hiatus, saying, like, oh, yeah, we, we kind of left out a while in there. Also, the North Pole still has ice. Very notable. Anybody can look at that. You don't have to be a scientist to see it. And also the day after tomorrow style ice age is still a day away. Not to mention that Al Gore has uh, multiple homes, some on the sea with a $30,000 electricity bill. So how green is it? So I guess, Al, it's not too easy being green. Stay tuned right after this break for more special reports. I'm Jakari Jackson right here from the InfoWars Command Center. Joining us for the rest of the hour, uh, co-hosting with us is John Rappaport, nomorefakenews.com. I'm not going to get into this investigative journalist or author, researcher, uh, but uh, he's worked as an investigator for some of the biggest uh, publications and TV stations and networks uh, out there. And he's just really a smart guy. We always like getting his commentary, not just here on my show, but uh, on the nightly news as well, no more fake news.com. A lot of his great books there on philosophy, uh, history, uh, research, the media, a uh, very, very thought provoking fellow. I wanted to get him on about the general state of the world. Also, an article he wrote about where TPP and the globalist takeover uh, is going right now. And just cover a smattering uh, of the waterfront uh, and, of course, take your calls. But, John, wow, what do you make of Trump? I mean, I don't know what your answer is going to be, but clearly, re regardless of who he is, we're seeing a collapse of the credibility of the system uh, way beyond what you wrote about with my Piers Morgan uh, appearance. This just seems to be cascading. Where does it go from here, and what are the elite going to do to try to maintain control? Or do you disagree? There hasn't been a collapse. No, there's a collapse, all right, Alex, because of what he's saying. You know, it's really simple. You can hate him. You can say he's a fake, he's a phony, he's this or that and so forth. But when the guy gets up and gives a foreign policy speech and says, uh, we need to end globalism, <laughs> for example, we need to cancel these trade treaties, these giant treaties that are sucking life and money and jobs out of America. Uh, he's talking common sense that the media have refused to discuss for 20, 30 years or more. And now there it is. So if you don't like the guy, if you hate him, look at the words. Forget who's saying them. Look at the other side of the coin. I mean, really, the other side of the coin. Who's the other guy who's talking about these trade deals and globalism all throughout the campaign? Bernie Sanders. Put together the voting block of Sanders plus Trump because a lot of that voting block has to do with defeating globalism and canceling these trade treaties. Look at the size of that voting block versus the witch who's riding down the center stripe on her blood-soaked hands, Hillary Clinton, who is a globalist to the core, and you realize the divide-and-conquer strategy here. I mean, it's unbelievable. Let's take uh, the people in the United States, all of whom know that this is a complete farce, a crime, a tragedy, uh, the destruction of the country as we move into the globalist framework for the world order of the future, Let's, let's just forget all about that, but let's divide and conquer these people. Let's put them on opposite sides where they're screaming at each other over the fence so that Hillary just rides down the middle and wins. Well, that's what's happening. That's, that's what's a great point. Happen. Do you think Trump understands that? At your gut level, do you think the fix is in? 
No, I think he understands this very well. The question is, does Bernie Sanders understand it? And I think in his heart of hearts alone at night, he does. He's looking at Trump and scratching his head and saying, I hate this guy. He's everything that I don't want to be. He's everything that, w that shouldn't happen to America. But, you know, I have to admit on the issue of the trade treaties and globalism, I mean, we both know pretty much the same data and we're on the same side. Yeah, if so Sanders has credibility, he's got to go with Trump, but he's not. He says he'll pledge to Hillary, who's gotten more corrupt Wall Street money, more dirty, crony capitalist war money than anybody ever in history. I mean, she is disgusting. But but how epic is it, as you just said, John Rappaport of NoMoreFakeNews.com, that Trump's saying, cancel globalism, up with sovereignty, up with basic things. That is so anathema to the enemy. There's no way they can be behind him because he's bringing back nationalism and framing the debate. England's trying to get out of the EU. The narrative's changing. World government's in trouble. The plan isn't going according to plan. They're in trouble. Big trouble. You know, Obama has to go over there to England and say <laughs> to the England, to the, you know, Britain, UK, to the leaders, to the people, if you don't stay in the European Union, meaning globalism, because that's what it's all about. If you get out, you have to go to the back of the line to negotiate a separate trade treaty with the United States. Well, you know, that tells you who Obama is. And the UK well, should call that bluff in a minute, just like we should when the communist Chinese tell us what to do. Exactly. You know, you say, well, what, what are you talking about? You're talking about defeating everything that needs to be defeating. And you're saying, no, we should join up with the insanity. So please leave, get out. You have such a way of crystallizing the battlefront and what we're really seeing. John, how profound is it that they're so arrogant now, they tell us the TPP's written, it merges all these unions together. It's, it's above the law. We get copies finally after they pass it. Just totally draconian. But still, nothing is, 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 is really being said about it in mainstream media. But meanwhile... They get arrogant and say, hey, we don't even have to uh, have elections anymore. Those never counted. We just appoint the people now. But that backfired. That didn't work. It shows they can only go so, uh, too, so far. And I think they've tried to go too far, and it's really backfiring. Uh, your comment on what he was saying and on that uh, police misrepresentation. Absolutely. It, as he says, it's been going on for a very long time. The first great trade treaty gap after the Second World War they started negotiating that in 1945. So this goes back a long way, the plan. And the plan is to empower these mega corporations to decide the law for whatever country they're in. I mean, people have to understand it. These trade treaties, as they're called, TPP, TTIP. This is all about saying, look, the judicial system of countries is extinct. We don't need this anymore. What we're going to have instead is corporate tribunals. And this is all about a corporation saying, look, we've got all this stuff that we want to sell all over the world. And we don't care whether you think it's toxic, destructive, you know, pesticides and toxic medical drugs, GMOs, uh, tainted food, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to sell it. And if any country refuses it, then we're going to sue that right. government in a corporate tribunal the judicial system of that country will have nothing to say about it. And hey, listen, there's an interesting story today. The NFL has told their players not to eat meat from Mexico. But citizens right. can. They're shipping yeah. it in record right. numbers full of steroids and drugs. That That's a powerful article. That's in the LA Times and others. Talk about it. Yeah, because the players could test positive for steroid use and be suspended. So it's like saying, well, we don't know what's in the food, but we know that some of the food coming from Mexico has got this stuff in it. And if you, an NFL star, eat this meat, then you could test positive for steroids. But, but it's okay for your kids. But It's okay for your kids. Kids, everybody else, it's fine, whatever. And the reason I bring this up is because in these trade deals, what's happening is people will not be able to know what country their food is coming Just from. Just like That's we can't know GMO food. labeling here, and, and, and let's expand. That's one small part of it, but key, they're also diplomatically and corporately immune, and they can also use the regulations to shut down domestic operators. It's a monopoly takeover system. Absolutely. They can say, 
This is the food for planet Earth. Deal with it. You can't resist it because we have these tribunals that will overcome any system you now have. So it turns to the people to revolt against this completely, just the way they're now revolting against the political system. And it's I was about to say, it's a microcosm as above, so below, that they would try to go, hey, we have superdelegates that decide now. That's the way it is. Go and shut. People said, wait, we vote. You're, you, uh, so see, it's backfiring. That's the good news. As long as we resist, look at the Brexit. How exciting is that for you? Fantastic. You know, the pe uh, nobody in England who isn't a globalist wants to stay in the European Union. The whole idea is England would leave the European Union and say, gee, guess what? Uh, we're a country. Uh, we forgot about that. We're our own country. We can protect ourselves. Yeah, we don't need the bureaucrats to make 91% of our laws and open our borders yeah. and, 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 and tell us we can't fly the, the stars and, and, and bars because it's racist or stars and stripes. Or, I mean, it's just crazy. Completely crazy. So I'm just hoping that this movement gains a lot more steam because there are a lot of people in the U.S., I can tell your listeners in, in England, who are rooting for you to get out of the European Union completely because this will start sure. a domino effect. Absolutely. They're saying that it's already happening. And here's the good news. Thomas Jefferson said the level of tyranny you will live under is the exact amount you put up with. It's equilibrium, folks. It's, it's, if you put up with tyranny... It'll just push and push and push till the execs are in your house saying, you know, let me have sex with your wife, like, like rollerball. You know, we own you. You've got to stand up for yourself. Welcome back to our live coverage of the Indiana primary, which has now turned out to be our live coverage of the end of the GOP primaries because we've had Ted Cruz officially drop out after being shellacked in Indiana. So um, we're going to take a look at that. Before we go on, we were just talking before we went to the break, Rob, about how it's going to be interesting now that the general election is beginning. Right. Uh, he's going to bring out all of Hillary's skeletons. And she had a very interesting remark this last week when she came out and started talking about her off-the-reservation remark. And I want to get <laughs> Joe Biggs and uh, Jakari Jackson to come in on this, too. Here's what she said. Uh, she said, I've had a lot of experience dealing with men who sometimes get off the reservation in the way they behave and how they speak. She says, I'm going to have trouble with uh, Trump because I can handle men who get off the reservation oh. in their behavior. And he came back and he said, uh, well, you know, first of all, she's insulted the Indians and, and they were upset about that. I think she issued an apology to them, but she didn't issue an apology to men. And I think she wants to put everyone, not just men, I think she wants to put all of us on a reservation because, you know, the reservations are the original Agenda 21, the original exactly. socialist uh, uh, detainment camps. She admitted that in a speech. She called it fun camps. I have decided we really need camps for adults. <laughs> and we need the fun camps that you all run. I mean, really. Yeah. Adults can go and have That's fun. Right. That's, That's where right. we don't have to worry about working. We don't have to worry about bills or, or taking and care of our kids. You're going to go to the reservation. States you're not going to get out. do it for us. You well, know? you know, it's a fun camp. Back, uh, we had, uh, you, you talked and you interviewed and you shot the um, interviews with um, Russell Means. Yeah. American Indian Movement. And he wrote a book called Where White Men Fear to Tread. And he it's talked an amazing about how, too. yeah, he talked about how, he said, look, the American government has broken every treaty they've ever made with the Indians. And he goes, now they're breaking the treaty they made with you, white man the Constitution. What are you going to do about it? Look at the reservation system. What they did to the Indians on the reservation system is now what they're doing in the cities to everyone. And it is a system of socialist control. And she came back and tried to walk these statements back and said, no, no, no. I was thinking about Rudy Giuliani and Rick Lazio. And then she goes on to say, people have been <laughs> dumping stuff on me for 25 years. I don't think she was talking about Rudy and Rick. I think people that have been dumping bad behavior on her was Bill. I think we got that right. <laughs> <laughs> from the very beginning. It's a passive aggressive uh, bill hating. That's right. That's and I, right. I guess no better person to bring on right now uh, to talk about Hillary and her the skeletons that are going to be in her closet when we see this general election kick off is investigative journalist Wayne Madsen from the Wayne Madsen Report, also reporting for Infowars.com. Wayne, what do you make of the uh, landslide victory today with Donald Trump? Well, I, I, <laughs> I'm really not too surprised. I, I really believe that the reason... Uh, Trump uh, decided to go for the jugular of Cruz with uh, the father uh, and Lee, you know, association with Lee Harvey Oswald is that his internal polls showed him so far ahead. He figured 
look, I, I can just drive a final uh, a nail in the coffin of this guy, Cruz, and he, it looks like he did it. Yeah, absolutely. But I think he, he and that's the thing about Donald Trump. I think they underestimate him as a candidate. He is going to expose everything that Hillary has done. Don't you believe <laughs> he's going to go for everything? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The guy, you know, the guy I, I said a, a long time ago, I said, you know, the reason why you know, remember Norman Lear created all in the family he was hoping uh, white middle class, especially men would laugh at the uh, Archie Bunker character. Uh, and then th thus, thus they would look at their own failings. He said, I never thought they'd laugh along with them. That's right. So I think and and they laughed at his model of the guy who was supposed to be reasonable, I guess, Meathead, right? The son-in-law. Yes, he was supposed yes. to be the one to educate us all. And we were all laughing at him and saying, what a dupe. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, so what we have here is a case of uh, people in Indiana uh, affiliated themselves with Trump's comments, just as people in Pennsylvania and New York and, uh, and South Carolina and Florida and every other state he went and did. And uh, I, I think, uh, you know, we also, I don't know how it's going to turn out. It looks like Bernie Sanders may pull up, pull an upset too. People on both sides are frustrated with their, the political insiders in both parties. And we're just seeing a, a, a visceral reaction against them. Absolutely. Uh, Have you... Elites. Wayne, have you heard uh, Greg Gutfeld laughing about the JFK story and saying that Donald Trump pivoted towards Alex Jones? Did you hear that remark? No, but I'm not. Greg Gutfeld is an incredibly non-funny person. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what comedy clubs he appears at, but if um, I, I would never pay for a ticket to listen to the guy. I think oh, is he a legitimate comedian? I, I don't watch him. He really I, is supposed to be a comedian? He's supposed to be a comedian, oh, okay. but you know, when you're a comedian, you're supposed to be funny. <laughs> No. Um, imagine if Hillary Clinton claimed that Bernie Sanders had a role in the killing of Bobby Kennedy. We would be going crazy right now. Yes. We'd be going wall to yeah. wall. But no, have we? Are we about to uh, achieve a historical first in electing the first conspiracy freak president? I mean, is this the pivot we've been talking about? He's not pivoting for presidential. He's pivoting to Alex Jones. He's pivoting to crazy. Uh, and he's he's not funny. He's just an arrogant. Uh, well, right. I have some words I could use. I won't. But, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the guy, uh, you know, first of all, what's he doing on a political roundtable program? Uh, uh, you know, he doesn't have any credentials to talk about anything. He's not a journalist. He doesn't do any investigation. He has a superficial knowledge of what's going on. And so are these other guys, I mean, it was just a, it was what, about uh, a month or so ago that they were laughing, National Review and the rest of these people were yeah. laughing about Why the not? 28 pages. They didn't even know what that was, okay? And so they were saying, hey, uh, Donald Trump turned into an Alex Jones caller. And now we're hearing the same thing from this. And when he brought the subject up, the people on the panel were going, what? what? I don't know what that is, a JFK yeah. <laughs> assassination? Well, maybe. Yeah, so maybe. clueless. Maybe they need to have Gilbert Gottfried join Greg Gutfeld on that show on Fox and they can just bore people with their bad humor. Yeah, yeah. Well, they ought to do a little bit of investigation if they're going to get on a show and uh, talk about things. But I guess we don't have to have journalists anymore uh, to have a talk show. They don't have to do any investigation. They set the bar pretty low, I guess. Well, that's true. Uh, you know, the White House Correspondents Center used to be all journalists and their sources. And now half the people that show up are from Hollywood. I mean, they don't add anything to the occasion. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they're there, uh, uh, but uh, you know, uh, that's that's the that's the way the Washington press corps wants it, the White House press corps, and and so they've got this uh, sort of uh, vapid annual event where um, they they get some uh, comic, uh, like in this case, Larry Wilmore, who really, I think, was despicable for using uh, a term, uh, whether you like Obama or don't like him. Mm -hmm. I don't think that word had any place at that White House Correspondents' Dinner. Well, yeah, they used to say politics is uh, show business for ugly people. I guess it's show business for people who aren't even remotely entertaining anymore, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, they, they call the White House Correspondents' Dinner the nerd prom for a reason. <laughs> now, I, now, now I just think it's uh, it, it's not what it was. I know people who went uh, to these uh, events many, many years ago when they were strictly a journalist event. Either journalists were trying to curry favor with a source uh, that they hoped to get information from, or they did it to thank a source who had already given them some information. Mm -hmm. So it was it was that type of uh, uh, event, but no longer. It's now uh, 
almost like it's the Oscar, uh, uh, the Emmy, uh, you know, Emmy or Oscar awards. As the election cycle starts to heat up, we see a lot of violence perpetrated at political rallies, in particular Donald Trump rallies by people who aren't even Donald Trump supporters. So we're going to come out here and ask the people if Donald Trump should suspend his campaign in lieu of violence. Hey, how you doing today, folks? Hi. We're asking people their views on the 2016 election. Do you have a favorite candidate? No, I don't know. I don't know enough about it right now. That's fair enough. Sorry. I'll just tell you one quick thing and get your comment. OK, so uh, the Donald Trump rallies are having a lot of violence take place at them. You know, people are trying to flip over cop cars and all that. Do you think that Donald Trump should stop his rallies because of the violence that happens at those protests? Yes, maybe. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I think so. John? No. He shouldn't, no. He shouldn't have to stop his rallies. That's, uh, unfortunately, that happens often. That's a problem, but he's not causing it, and so he shouldn't be responsible for, for stopping it. What are your views of Donald Trump? <laughs> Better than Hillary. We're talking to people about the 2016 election. Do you have a favorite candidate? Um, Clinton. Clinton? Mm -hmm. What's your favorite view about Clinton? Anything in particular? Um, you know, she wasn't my favorite starting out, but she's the front runner and for Democrat, and um, I uh, will go with the Democrat because they have most of the values that I have. So, okay. mm -hmm. well, on the Republican side, one of the hot issues is a lot of the um, violence that's happening at Trump rallies, anti-Trump rallies. Do you think that they should suspend Trump's rallies because of the violence there? Uh, no. Yeah, I'm gonna vote for Hillary. Any particular reason? Well, I think she's got the most experience. Um, I actually like uh, what Bernie Sanders has to say in terms of his positions. I think he's a really progressive and very knowledgeable guy for what would be best for the country. But I think Hillary has more experience and will probably be able to implement what needs to be done to move us forward. Do you think that Donald Trump should suspend his rallies in lieu of all the violence? You know what I really think is people should stop being violent at his rallies because I don't think I think it's it's counterproductive actually. I think Trump's such a fool that if people, you know, just behave themselves and demonstrate peaceably, it would probably be the best possible thing to do to discredit him more. But if people are violent, then they feed right into his BS rhetoric, unfortunately. I'm supporting Hillary Clinton. Okay. Any particular reason? I've been following her since Bill Clinton was elected president in 1992, and, and she has stood up for just about everything that I care about since that time, and I think she, that she's absolutely the most qualified candidate. Okay. A similar question. Uh, we'll talk about the political rallies. There's a lot of violence going on there, especially the Donald Trump rallies. Do you think maybe Donald Trump should suspend his rallies in lieu of violence? I think Donald Trump should suspend his rhetoric. Um, that is inciting people to be this violent. Do you have a favorite presidential candidate? Uh, probably Bernie Sanders. Bernie so. Sanders? I don't know enough to make an informed yeah. opinion, but I guess Bernie Sanders. Now, Bernie is a self-described democratic socialist. Does that concern you at all? Honestly, not too much because I don't feel like he's in particularly like wanting to change the whole thing into a socialist like reform of a country. Socialist is just a big word for caring about the people, honestly. <laughs> yeah. It's supposed to be scary because we give it negative connotations from past experiences, but there's nothing bad with being a socialist, you know? Do you think Donald Trump should suspend his political rallies in lieu of violence? I, as much as I want to say yes, I kind of feel like if he did that, then we'd still be like stepping on his rights and I think, stuff. Isn't so. most of the violence for, I mean, I haven't heard a lot about it. Isn't most of the violence caused from people who go and aren't Trump supporters? There's going to be conflict in anything. There's always conflict either between police and protesters or two opposing groups. When Blackhawks a couple of years back, they won the Stanley Cup and Chicago was shut down for two days because of the rights. It's not the same thing because obviously there's different motives, but it gets more coverage because it's what what people want to see, you know, they want to see how the, the people they don't like are doing dumb things and makes them feel better about their convictions. It's really important for us to remember our history. You know, uh, uh, unless you're one of the first Americans, 
a Native American, you came from someplace else. Somebody brought you. We trade that reservation and the value of that reservation and the value of its people, the value of its air, the value of its carbon emissions are traded on Wall Street and Dun and Brad through Dun and Brad Street. It's listed. So we haven't even hit on all the swindles that Wall Street is visiting upon the people of America. You're nothing but a bunch of coupons for the United States government and the people who run it. That's it. American people, you're a commodity and you don't deserve anything else. And they're going to make sure you continue to be a commodity as long as the empire exists. As long as you allow the Constitution to be raped. As the flood of illegals surges over the southern border, President Obama is going for broke, literally. CNS News reports that since the budget deal was signed in November of 2015, in just six months, Obama has added another trillion to our national debt, bringing it to a monstrous 19 trillion. While more taxpayer money is thrown at the Immigrations and Customs Enforcement deportation budget, deportations themselves have decreased increased by nearly 43%. Breitbart reports, according to a recent chart from the Senate Subcommittee on Immigration and National Interest, ICE removed nearly 43% fewer total aliens from the United States in the fiscal year of 2015 than it did in the fiscal year of 2012, and nearly 62% fewer aliens from the interior of the United States. Ironically, as the number of deportations the Obama administration carried out tumbled, its budget for removals and detention continue to grow from 2,750,843,000 in fiscal year 2012 to 3,431,444,000 in fiscal year 2015. But the most alarming statistic from Breitbart's report is that ICE removed 235,390 criminal aliens from the United States in fiscal year 2012, as compared with 139,368 in fiscal year 2015, meaning that it deported nearly 41% fewer criminal aliens last year, with 25% more resources than it had in fiscal year 2012. As illegal immigrant crimes in the U.S. go largely unreported, even mentioning the unwarranted murders of American citizens by illegal immigrants is deemed racist by New World Order brainwashed dupes. And if you think the perpetual raping going on by ungrateful Islamic hordes is only occurring in Europe, think again. New documents say the man accused of kidnapping and sexually assaulting a gas station worker uttered Allah Akbar during the assault. Four illegal aliens from Guatemala are charged in the rape of a Massachusetts woman and the vicious beating of her boyfriend. And one of the suspects was arrested less than a month before the attack. The quartet has been saddled with a slew of charges. It's been two years since Fusion reported that a staggering 80% of Central American girls and women crossing Mexico en route to the United States are raped along the way. Meanwhile, Panama announced they are transferring 3,000 U.S.-bound Cuban migrants to Mexico as Cuban migration spikes. And in 2016, immigrant families crossing the border is 40% higher than the previous record in 2014. When the history books are written, the flood of a great unknown and unchecked exodus of chaos in the face of all reason, civility, and legality revolving around the enforcement of immigration laws that have dictated the policy for immigration for centuries will go down as one of the most reckless acts instigated by a U.S. president in modern history. But every time you try to get away from the government, they'll kill you. I put you in prison. or let you become an American. <laughs> if you catch my drift. Because you're the new Indian. You're the new American Indian. Congratulations. Welcome to the club. Well, that's it for our show tonight. I'm Jakari Jackson from the InfoWars Command Center, and we'll see you again tomorrow night.